And a very good afternoon, just about. It's one o'clock in the afternoon on Wednesday, March 27th, uh, at least in California. It's four o'clock in the afternoon on the East Coast. Uh, and welcome to Daring Life. David, how are you, my friend? Thanks for the thanks for the world clock. Um, I'm doing well. Yeah. <laughs> and the world clock, sir. I have at least two separate cups of coffee going on right now, so I am ready to roll. Shout out to Anthony, by the way, OIT technician, who just came in and bought me a, a very, very strong uh coffee today so i'm wow. fairly buzzing as Roll. it goes right yeah. yeah not bad not bad we've got some uh, fun guests so we had a lot of fun last week uh with the man bela fleck on the show that was a really fun episode uh and we've got a pretty packed couple of weeks uh obviously today and then let's talk about the next two weeks what does that look like for you yeah we next week we have uh jerry douglas uh coming on you know not a banjo player but he he uses our our pro picks, uh, finger picks, and uh, but has been around a lot of banjo players through his career. So we're gonna we're gonna have a good a good chat with him. That's gonna be fun. Good chat into the mind of someone who's played with the best of them over the years. And then uh, the week after, I think we have uh, Evie Laden coming on. Yeah. To talk about some claw hammer jams. Yep, that'll be fun too. She's been on once before, but and uh, we'll uh, we'll be able to gain into claw hammer and 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 how to. Uh, um, how to you know do some some jamming with call hammer play, playing very cool and you've been working on a bit of a uh a calendar project of late i have been because as spring is rolling in you know it's it's festival season it's uh, coming you know, up it, yeah. you know it's there's it's, it's kicking off at, you know the end of march festivals start rolling and uh and so we've made a festival calendar a festival and banjo camp calendar so you can uh you can find something near you or or just something that you've been looking to go to and see what's out there there's there's a lot out there so um on our website you can go at the top navigation on the right there's a thing that says lifestyle and underneath there you'll see festival and event calendar you can go in there and go check out um you know go get out there and see some live music and geez, there's there's a lot happening this year it certainly is and one of the first uh festivals that we've got coming up that we'll be attending uh will be in about a month from now and that's uh Melfest, uh at north carolina uh and just to segue beautifully into that our guests today will be <coughs> at Melfest as well so we hope to see them in person there we look forward to it but what do you say we jump in and, and bring these boys in let's do it all right so you guys already probably know who they are but uh our guests today are the finest Irish band in bluegrass, hailing all the way from Ireland, but now living in the U.S. Jig Jam continue to make waves with their energetic fusion of traditional Irish music and American traditional music, including bluegrass. And today we're going to talk about a number of different things, including their new album, Across the Pond. So without further ado, please welcome Jig Jam. There they are. Hello. Hello. How's it going? Hello. Good. How are you doing, guys? Not too bad, no. I'm going to rearrange the screen here just a little bit. There we go. Let's have you on full. How are you? You guys are not in Ireland. You are in uh, St. Louis right now. In St. Louis at the moment, yeah. It's kind oh, of yeah. a home away, home away from home as such for most of us anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we're in Kevin's basement at the minute. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. No, no, yes. Nothing like a basement in St. Louis uh, yeah. to be. Yeah. I'm telling you, all sorts happen down here, I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Well, we're excited to have you and get into some uh, some conversation. Uh, really, really excited about the new album. Um, but uh, this is what we do on Daring Live. We kick things off with a little tune, if you are so inclined to entertain uh, the masses. Show them yeah. who you are. All right. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah, yeah. Very good. So so you kicked it off there with uh, your version of Cluck Old Hen, you, a track that you have on uh, your latest album, Across the Pond, right there? Yeah, that was Cluck Old Hen. And then we did a jig called The Monaghan Twig. So uh, we put it into our the generator in our heads, and it came out as Cluck Old Twig. Ah, track name, very creative. Which is just genius, really. If you think yeah. about it. <laughs> very, very clever. <laughs> very good. Yeah, all of y'all are, you know, the, the plane's so tight and rhythmically tight on out of all of your plane. It's it's fantastic. Um what what made you decide to join those two tunes together kind of? Um that particular tune, the, the Monaghan Twig is one that we've been playing for years. It's just a real banger, as we'd say, you know, it's one of the ones that I suppose is always popular in Irish sessions and stuff like that. And it's it's easy as well. It's I, I find sometimes the the simpler tunes allows you a little bit more wiggle room to put stuff into them as regards variations right. and things like that. And just as well, it's a drivey one to play live. We play a lot of kind of lively stuff when we're gigging and everything for festivals and things like that. And then I think the same goes for Cluck Hall Hen. There's not many notes in it, so there's a, a little bit of scope for for variation in that too. And then I think just putting the two together with an old time and an Irish tune. It's kind of just our our little recipe, really, for putting tune sets together. We try to mix and match whether it's a bluegrass tune, an Irish tune, or an old time tune, uh, and just try and take both those genres and kind of mess with them a little bit, like playing playing them the way they should be a little bit and playing, the way, playing them in our own way as well, do you know? So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I liked uh, you know the the you know some of the harmonic um, you know the, the harmonic changes you're adding to that like at the beginning of Clock of Land there on the banjo that that strum that open kind of kind of gave like a breath to the tune at the beginning it was nice. Um, do you plan when you're playing these tunes live something like that? Um, is there is how much different improvisation is there versus when you're recording and has, are there times when it when it gets into kind of more of an extended jam sort of thing or is it generally kind of a similar format you know uh, nine it, kind of it varies so like if you take that one for an example um what we played there is close enough to what we recorded but then there's improvisation in every instrument at certain times mm -hmm. so sometimes that can get longer depending on the crowd, if we think the crowd is into it, sometimes depending on something, something as simple as the, the time we have left in a gig, we yeah. might think we had to wrap it up a little bit quicker. But yeah, we do have certainly have scope in certain parts of that that set of tunes where, yeah, sometimes we might lose the run of ourselves altogether. But uh, yeah, so it varies really, I'd say, is the answer to that question. Cool. And so you, you had, came out with a new uh, full-length album, you know, this year across the pond. Well, let's talk about, you know, talk about kind of the, the song selection and kind of the, the and and getting into it. What was the idea, you know, before you start recording? What was what, what were you going for, and and what was the general kind of idea of, of, of as this was in your first time, you know, putting on a record. Uh I think we've always been striving towards um, the Irish bluegrass crossover mix and I suppose striving towards getting a full album that properly reflects that crossover, mm -hmm. which I think we've gotten close to in years past with different albums. But I think this is definitely the closest we've got to, I suppose, the jig jam sound and what we want it to be. Uh, so as regards picking songs and tunes what we did with that cluck old twig set the tune sets in across the pond all sort of have that not i wouldn't call it a format but those uh, influences behind it mm -hmm. we we have a kind of a bucket of tunes that we would mess around with and we we like whether it's coming from the bluegrass side of things maybe dahi might have something on the five string or else gavin might have a, a trad tune from Ireland on the on the other on the tenor banjo, um. So again, sometimes we just mix and match as regards tunes. But songs, 
there were some songs already written that made sense to the to the team and then a couple of songs i suppose were written with that team in mind to try and capture that crossover like we trying to always write as much as we can but like we've certainly written songs before that just they might be a, a, a fine song or they might be be okay in that regard but they mightn't just suit jig jam or they mightn't suit the the team that we were going for and across the pond so i suppose the originals were all trying to fit that description mm -hmm. yeah and, and what's the kind of what is the songwriting process for the band uh, you know does one person bring in a tune or does a full ready tune or is it somebody bring in an idea and then you kind of you all work it out together um it's 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 been varied as well like there's uh either it could be full songs brought into the band nearly ready to go or else sometimes it might just be a verse or a chorus um or even just a riff and when it's brought into the band everybody can kind of give their 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 spake on what they think it should be or where it could go but then yeah there are other times that you know i suppose the song comes in ready made and even like i know guys in the past have come out like in with songs and to kind of even have an idea for what each instrument should do, which makes it easier, you know, that we can just write, okay, roll in with that, and, and it mightn't need much work at all. And does everybody uh, everybody bring in original tunes, or is there one of y'all kind of the main songwriter? Uh, we all bring in original tunes. Uh, it's kind of just an open book, really, as regards we have a WhatsApp group that we send stuff into, and then it's just down to a selection process on what, it's going to make the cut or not and what makes sense to the album what the album needs whether it needs a certain amount of fast songs certain amount of slow songs different keys different topics and we just try and whittle it down that we think that is gonna i suppose benefit the album the best we can for, for what we're working with super cool i love it we have this question here from uh, kelly um Time to Go Home is my absolute favorite track on the album. Uh, I'm curious to know why they decided to add the Robin on the album as it's on another album of theirs as well. Do you want to speak a little bit uh, to that one? Yeah, that's me again, I suppose. Uh, <laughs> sounds, like, sounds like you're taking on, the, on most of yeah, the Yeah, I don't mean to, but those two songs, they're, they're two of them that I wrote myself. Uh, well, thanks for the Time to Go Home, yeah. That's a, a kind of, that was a song that was written as a closer to an album and as a closer to a gig which we're doing live the kind of final song uh before people actually go for the door and head home it's a description of a, an irish pub scene with a, a music session going on and people are just singing their last song and after a great night and they all head for the door uh but to answer the robin uh the robin is the first song i ever wrote personally uh we brought it into the band we recorded it and uh i think we can all say we i think we murdered it a little bit in the last album and it was one of those ones that always uh do you know we always kind of looking back thinking oh, i wish we did a, a better job on that or a different approach and that was obviously one reason we wanted to do a better job on it but also the it fitted the team of across the pond so it wasn't just random so the robin is i suppose it's about emigration and people leaving ireland due to lack of work in in different different shapes and forms and the robin is a metaphor for that really that the robin doesn't have these worries these life worries of uh of having to worry about getting work and employment and i suppose i wrote that song just after college when a lot of my friends were going to australia or america for for jobs and things like that so there's a little robin that comes to comes to the window that my dad feeds every day with a couple of <laughs> orange oats flavins oats <laughs> and uh yeah that's where that came from so i think we just wanted to give do that song justice but as well as doing that it fitted the the vibe of the album as well so there's like a hundred different segues i could go from here but i'll, I'll go this one elizabeth ward uh says be honest the addition of kevin to the robin put a shine on it but it didn't have before uh i think there's some nodding going on there so i think we can probably uh, all agree but kevin you're 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 a newer addition to the band and you know you're, you're holding the venue for the day here uh, at least for this uh, this small hour uh let's get into that a little bit 
Um, how did that all come about? Um, I think, like you said, the last time we had you guys on was June of 2021. So there's there's a lot that's happened uh, with you guys since then, um, including your location. So Kevin, talk to us a little bit about how you became involved and and what that process was like. Um, well, um, I'll make a, a Spinal Tap reference. Um, <laughs> if you're familiar with the drummer in the drummer <laughs> saga and Spinal Tap. Mm-hmm. Similar thing in Jake Jam with the fiddle players. Yeah, they're just spontaneously composed. Yeah, little green, <laughs> little green globules left on the chair and whatnot. Um, well, the, they, uh, I, I think it really comes down to the fact that um, uh, the guys started coming over to St. Louis in 2016. Yeah, yep. 2016, and um, we, uh, I would come down and like sound check the guys and and. Um, we knew each other, so that was already kind of established. And when uh, there was a vacancy um, and they needed somebody, uh, it, it was it, it was just kind of an easy. <laughs> let's be honest. It was, it was just yeah. it was just kind of an easy choice, really, because I was here. They were in the city, and um, we were familiar with each other musically as well mm-hmm. at that point. So. Um, uh, I just needed to learn all their stuff, basically, um, which um, was uh, and I, I guess I, I hadn't really I hadn't really, uh, you know, I was familiar, familiar with the band and the albums. But once I started learning the materials, like, whoa, these these guys are this this the arrangements are, are very musical and interesting. Mm-hmm. And um, so that that's that's kind of how I got in, really. Had you jammed at all? Like just kind of musically oh, outside of uh, like playing their, their music and just kind of. I, I definitely got up a few times yeah. like on the, uh, yeah. at the, on the stage. Yeah. I think we might've had some late night Probably sing songs yeah. and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah, yeah I think so. Yeah. And awesome. what, where, what's kind of your background, Kevin, is you, are you come from like the Irish fiddle background or, or is it bluegrass or old time or kind of a mishmash of all of that? <clears throat> I grew up playing Irish music. I started okay. with that. Okay. And um, I got very involved in the Irish music community. Um, but just kind of being raised here uh, in St. Louis, there's there's a lot of um, other types. There's a lot of uh, music. It's a very yeah. musical city. So I, I've been exposed to bluegrass and old time and blue. A lot of there's a lot of there's a big blues scene here and mm-hmm. And jazz is really big, so um, I kind of and country music. So I, I got into that a, when I was a teenager. It kind of broadened up a bit, but I would say I started with Irish music. That's gotcha. Awesome. Sorry, Dave. Go ahead. Yeah, and and so what was the why and why did the band start coming over to St. Louis since 2016, specifically St. Louis? Um, not were you coming specifically there, or just passing through on on a, on a tour? Uh, yeah, I think it's your time. To... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we got the recommendation uh, from a friend of ours, a great tenor banjo player as well, called Keo Ryan. Um, uh, when we were touring over here first, uh, he recommended the the great Irish pub here in St. Louis, John D. McGurk's, to us. So we start gigging there, doing a little resident gig uh, two weeks at a time or something like that. So... Uh, so it's nice to spend time in the one place over here as well, rather than traveling around all the time touring. So we got a bit of a base set up here and we got involved uh, with the, the music scene here as well and got to know a lot of the people in the community as well. So uh, it was very nice. So shout out to P.O. Ryan out there. Yeah. that's a, I've read quite a lot about your affiliation with uh, uh, John D. McGurk's Irish Bar. I'm not familiar with it. Uh, Dave, I don't know whether you are or not, but it, it seems to be more than just an Irish bar. It, it seems to be like a pretty uh, prominent fixture in that in that world. Is that fair to say, or like how, why why that place? I guess is it just yeah, <laughs> no, it is. Yeah, the the great thing about McGurk's is, and again, we didn't know this before we got there. Uh, so many kind of legendary Irish musicians have played there, and there's pictures of them all up all, over the walls. Mm-hmm. Um, it's this random hidden gem that if you didn't hear of it, you suppose we didn't even know where St. Louis was, let alone McGurk's. 
Um, but yeah, like the great, great Irish trad players like Joe Burke and Jackie Daly, Martin Hayes, people like this would have done their time in McGurk's. And yes, it's a bar and it's a bar gig, but there's something different about it. There's a, it's nearly like a, sometimes it could be, it can feel like a listening room. Sometimes it can feel like a, it can be like a rave at the weekends. You, you kind of get a bit of everything. But uh, it's been a great chance for us to practice and get our our new material down because we just finished a residency there a few weeks ago. And, um, it, you know, just before we went on tour, we were able to play all our new stuff, you know, nearly every night of the week. So we didn't have to sit down in Kevin's basement and practice. We could just do it on a stage, which yeah. was nice, you know. Probably a bit like uh, you hear about stand-up comics, right? And they, they uh, try new material and they have this kind of one place that they always go to. Very informal, but the, it's a perfect opportunity to go live for the first time with stuff and make a, maybe make adjustments, maybe tweak a few things here and there, engage like, you know, like you say, real-time reactions rather than just being in that vacuum of, of like say in a basement and just maybe having a couple of people drop by for some opinions. But that's got to be quite helpful to have that kind of, you know, a two week stint of being able to do that. And then I guess the, 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 the idea is then you can go off on tour for a couple of weeks maybe, and then come back and, and kind of re repeat that process and just keep, keep it dialed in without having to spend months and months and months on the road. Is that kind of what the idea is there? Yeah, pretty much. Um, it was, it was a night, like we look at it was a paycheck as well when we were on, weren't on the road and it's, it's just a, yeah, it's a great outlet to, to play anything. And again, we would play anything. It, we could play a full hour of Jig Jam stuff and then we could end up just trying something completely bizarre just mm -hmm. for the fun of it, you know? And that's the beauty of that kind of gig. And again, it's on that stage, I know over the years where we've come up with little ideas and figuring stuff out or maybe an old traditional song that someone might sing completely randomly on a Wednesday night and say, Oh, that, hold on, that works. And it could end up in the, in the jig jam set then, you know, when you do yeah. go on the road. So yeah, it's been great for that kind of thing. That's awesome. That's awesome. And then you, you had, I want to get into kind of the, the coming to America part uh, in a little while here, but the, um, the other kind of big thing that's happened, you, you made your debut at the Opry not too long ago. Or... Yeah. Gav, do you want to talk about that? I'm doing a lot of talking. I, I want to know about it. And by the way, Gav, I think uh, mom and dad and brothers are tuning in watching. So you watch your language, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we were lucky enough to make our debut at the Opry uh, last March. Um, Needless to say, it was an unforgettable experience. Um, and then on the night, of course, you know, Steve Earl was there and Gar Brooks and Trisha Yearwood showed up afterwards <laughs> just as we were finished playing. And uh, yeah, it was really just amazing to get to play our music on a stage like that. Yeah. And um, yeah, we're actually just found out um, just two days ago that we're actually playing the Opry again next Wednesday, uh, oh, April. Nice. So um, yeah, the excitement is very high in the Jig Jam camp at the moment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> congratulations! That's that's huge. We had um, we had the guys from the well Colton from Dead South on recently, and they they, they played the Opry and they they played. Well, I think they're about to play the Opry and they played the Ryman and. Um, same idea, I guess, in as much as we always think of those venues as just have they're playing quite specific music, but they seem to be opening up to more kind of non traditional uh, stuff as well and trying to kind of you know expand the horizons, as it were. So, I think I read that you got a standing ovation on your first appearance. Um, so, I assume it was pretty well received. Uh, yeah, we we did. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's, it's still a bit hard to believe. I think they were stiff. I'm sure it was because of the raw talent. Yeah. But, but, but how was it? I mean, you know, was it was it just like as exhilarating as it sounds? To to were you surprised? Oh yeah, the whole yeah, thing was a bit like a blur, or like a dream. Uh, dream. I don't know when you. You try to prepare yourself for that, but when you stand on to the, into the little the circle and you look out to a full house, it was just they take your breath away. And yeah, should stand an ovation was just the cherry on top. It was ridiculous. It's still kind of hard to believe. Yeah. Uh, you know, playing our own kind of stuff is, yeah, it's it's very cool. It's, it's an appreciation for just good musicianship, right? 
and and just good music all all in all. I don't think anyone who walks in there is probably like, I'm not going to like it because it isn't a particular genre or because it's not doesn't fit a certain category. Like I think just people just appreciate really good music these days. Yeah, like I think if you do look at the opera, even next week, just looking at the lineup, it's still it's very diverse. Like there's a comedian on as well. Like there's a Rhonda Vincent is there like a pure legend of bluegrass there's a couple of country guys i think to have and the fact that we have the bluegrass aspect obviously gets gets us um you know on the horizon of the opry which is great but we're very different too you know um but we like to keep everything lighthearted and upbeat and lively so you know no matter what the venue is we we don't get too serious about anything and people hopefully can enjoy themselves, you know, and that's the, the aim of our game anyway. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, Dave, we're about the halfway point. Do we want to yeah, hear some more music? Some more music? Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Time to go home. This is, a, this is time to go home that I think it was Kevin. Yeah, awesome. So again, this is, uh, we've been playing this as the last kind of song of of the gigs on our tour lately and it's the last track on the album so it's uh i'm gonna have to keep talking now before dotty tunes up i'm just going into double c here for uh all the banjo players out there. and uh yeah this is a pub scene in tullamore where is uh where i'm from and uh imagine an Irish session after going haywire for the whole night and fellas losing their minds and all of a sudden there's one song left and this is kind of capturing that moment so all right you good one two three it's a cold Friday night in the town I was born and the wind and rain how should he hear? Inside in the snug is a light with a session and thrill for all who were there. Their hearts are kept warm with the reels and the jinx, along with a drop of the pure. Photos of old lovely heroes are nailed to the wall like old times before. It's time to go home. Down, orders ten pints of play as his wife tries to drag him to bed. One more little sub cries, old Johnny, as he takes off into dancing instead. The fire crackles along like the curly red hair of the fiddler who sits by the door. Brownie lets off the green fields round for band as the Buckley twins they shout for more. It's time to go home, time to go home, shake your hands and say your goodbyes, time to go song, what a sight to be seen. Tears in the eyes of our men as they rattle the walls with our on the feet. Head for the door and on to the west, windy streets of old Tullamore. The lights they go down but the music and fire is alive. 
outside in our corn. It's time to go home. Yeah, really nice, really nice. I want to um, ask Dati about playing um, like a non-bluegrass sort of songwriter, playing behind, playing, you know, wh what's your approach to, to playing to like a song, you know, not not like a bluegrass song tune, but just like a songwriter sort of tune like that. Because a lot of yeah. players get, a lot of five string banjo players are, are in that position where they're playing with songwriters and, you know, it's not necessarily a bluegrass scene. Um, how do you kind of use your bluegrass technique to, to back up that, that song? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, for that particular song, I'm just trying to not get in the way, kind of, and uh, just kind of be rippling in the background. Uh, so that song's in 3 4 as well. So I was just mm -hmm. doing a basic uh, backward roll, just a triplet thing. <laughs> Just something like that kind of simmering along in the background for the whole thing and uh not doing anything too out there or fancy and just trying to lock into the guitar really right. and yeah for a lot of the slow songs and stuff like that i'm trying i'm basically going off kind of jamie's guitar playing a good bit mm -hmm. we're trying to lock into that and not get too out there or, uh too fancy or anything mainly mainly arpeggiate you know the, the chord changes through there yes. and then kind of find a, a color spot here and there when you have when there's a chance maybe. yeah absolutely yeah and just have be in a different register than maybe the mandolin or the fiddle okay so just down low or something like that yeah trial and error as well see what works the studio is great for that as well if you have someone behind the desk and he's shouting at you saying calm down in there <laughs> yeah if you've been in the position where you've been playing too much i mean oh 100 yeah, percent. yeah yeah definitely in the early days just playing out over everything and showing off <laughs> but yeah it's nice to just uh hold back and just sit back into it into the background and just have a more of a texture than anything running through right. it yeah there's no there's no harm in, in just in playing simply absolutely yeah, yeah. uh easier said than done sometimes <laughs> totally um and what's for the for the record, what's kind of the recording process? Um, how long did y'all go in to do this? Did you record it all in in St. Louis? And tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. Do you want Kevin? You're the you're the microphone man. Oh, he's the maestro. Well, we recorded the album at a studio called Native Sound. Um, uh, that's run by a guy named David Beeman. And, um, yeah, uh, we, we just, uh, <laughs> well, I, I'd say it was probably two weeks, no more than that. Right. Well, yeah. Two, yeah, two yeah. stints. We, there we were had, two stints. Yeah. yeah. We had the first five tracks recorded. Uh, when was it? November? In oh June. no. In June. 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 Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Second one <was> in November. <laughs> yeah. We finished it in November then. Yeah. 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 It was pretty quick yeah. as far as I'm like so we, with yeah. projects that I'm used to doing. Um, uh, I, it, 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 uh, it was pretty efficient. I, I would say, I mean, we got a lot uh, for two weeks. That's pretty, I think it was doing eight, a record in yeah, eight days, eight days total, I think, you know? Yeah. yeah. We still had our add-ins like we, a couple of extra days for harmonies and, you know, we sent it away for double bass to a guy in Knoxville um daniel kimbrough is his name 
But other than that, yeah, it was fairly... We got the bones of it done in those eight days. But as regards to the process, yeah, we... Uh, we're kind of mainly just going in on our own. We didn't do... We tried to do a bit live, and then it was just quicker to go in individually. We'd start with guitar, then banjo, then mandolin and fiddle at the end. And, uh, yeah, try to get those bass things down. And then before we'd start on a main vocal, we'd throw a guide vocal down first and a guide guitar, and then we'd, we'd work off that. And did you, did you play to a click for those first few tracks? Yeah. Yeah, everything's to click. Tried our best. Uh, well, we tried our best. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the click was going on anyway. <laughs> Whether we were doing it, you know? Yeah. A couple of nudges here and there now, it's uh, around the click, but yeah. There was a click in our ears. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question from Jackie uh, Horan saying, uh, I see Gavin changed instruments for Time to Go Home. Does he have a preference to banjo or mandolin? Amazing musician on both big jam, on both big jig jam band. Um, it just depends on the song, really. Um, so a, a song like Time to Go Home is kind of a more mellow, subtle one. The mandolin... Um, just fits nicely in that and then as dot was saying I was just trying to just compliment the the song really and just not get in the way too much <laughs> and uh, i suppose then i'd play a banjo more for tune sets or we have a, um, a song june apple where there's the two banjos going on so um generally we try and just like um try and say if the, the five string might, might play a, a traditional irish tune and like the tenor might play like a bluegrass tune just to try and mix it up and show the capabilities of both instruments and um yeah it's good, it's good fun trying to arrange that and how do you do the when you have two banjos going on at the same time how do you how do you, you put in the earplugs, <laughs> <laughs> earplugs <yeah. laughs> um i suppose you just try and arrange it in a way that's like um so somewhat uh listenable, listenable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll add that Mark James uh, said, I had the pleasure of hearing Jig Jam live in Lancaster last Friday. It was a banjo extravaganza. <laughs> take that. We'll take that. We're going to call that. <laughs> Sorry to interrupt your question, Dave. Carry on. No, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> I was just going to, following up on that question, outside of putting in earplugs, like what is the balance there? Because you're playing a, a tenor and a, and a five string, right? So they're they're a little different. Kind of frequency wise but they're still they're still banjos so what yeah. is the balance there um it depends on uh the tunes as well like some of the tunes that we play um we might have the the tenor banjo playing in the the regular st style with the flat pick and then usually on the five string I'd, I'd probably go up an octave maybe just to have a different texture going on above it uh rather than getting in the way of it or or trying to have it in a rolling pattern as well rather than just a single string kind of way uh so this this still sound a bit different obviously they're different instruments as well but so you can put them in left or right speaker as well and have this different kind of texture going on maybe mm -hmm. up an octave and more cascading kind of effect on the five string and then the single string thing with the tenor banjo so sometimes it takes a while to figure that out sometimes but i think that tends to work on a lot of the the irish tunes and stuff like that plus we use use the fiddle yeah to our advantage there like the great thing about having kevin in the band is we have fiddle on everything uh and it's the only instrument that we have now that has sustain it's not too plucky it's not plucky you know like everything else and i think the fiddle can can kind of mask over the clunkiness of banjos mm -hmm. to make it work. And likewise, in the even you talk about the slower songs, I think since Kevin is playing fiddle on all the songs now, it allows the boys, the two boys here, to take probably a, a back seat as regards having to do as much because the fiddle is like your kind of lead guitar player in a rock band. You know, it's doing your, mm -hmm. your melodies and your sustainy stuff that's a lot more pleasant in that kind of slower slower style songs you know yeah mm -hmm. but when you go live uh you're playing something like the opry it's still just the four of you right you're not taking out 
kind of backing musicians or anything like that. So it's just literally the the four piece. Yeah, yeah. We do have a little. We have two two little live tricks as well. I have an octave mm -hmm. pickup on my guitar, um, which is this fella here, and I have two inputs. Ooh. Stare like that now. <laughs> it's uh, not so a guitar I, show, but now I'm curious. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, people always ask, they don't know where the bass is coming from, and uh, okay. a good few of the Irish players do it. So I run an extra pickup through an octave pedal, which brings it down to sound like a bass guitar, and then we also have a stamp box. So those are the kind of live uh, low end. So you're completely splitting that signal out into two, yeah, so basically I'm, for two separate uh, things, two. rather than just running the main one single signal through a, through an octave pedal. Yeah, yeah. So I have two channels for for the guitar setup yeah yeah that's very cool and how that, do you filter out just that string how do you that that, that low string uh, so i have it over the two the bottom two so the the a and the e string and again i literally just plug this into an amp and fiddle with it that i can get it at an angle that doesn't affect the d string too much and mm -hmm. just get these two so i play in standard so some people that do it in drop d or dag dad they might only need right. the bottom string but i kind of need two and then I keep a, a finger going on either of those through every chord so I can create a bass line. So I just had to adapt and use different shapes. But again, it's still, it's manageable, you know? Right. So the pickup is just, the, the bass pickup is just the is just on the underneath those two strings. Just those two strings, yeah. Right. And again, I might have it on until, you know, certain parts of tunes and songs. Mm -hmm. And then I just toggle on the pedal and then it'll go straight down. Bluegrass disco. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. And on the banjos, are we doing anything? Is that kind of the only pedals that we're we're using in the band, or are you using any effects on on the banjos or the fiddle or anything like that? Oh, I've got I've got a little. Um, I've got one of those um, TC pedals that it, mm -hmm. when you press on it, it makes weird sounds <laughs> so, I, I like the technical terms you just kind of fiddle with it and it just makes weird sounds and that's, that's yeah yeah that's exactly it so yeah. um I, I, I just kind of pop that in at appropriate moments if there's some sort of crescendo or if we really want to make a lot of noise basically um a cacophony a moment <laughs> oh, but only only a, a moment or two um but for the most part all the instruments are, are pretty direct i think even on the album, I mean, you're just hearing the sounds of the the instruments on or with mics in front. I mean, there's there's not a lot of processing or anything like that. Which I think is cool. I do. I, on the whole, I think that's great. I mean, it's, it's good. <clears throat> you seem to be using those kinds of things just to add a bit more kind of texture rather than to create a stylistic sound, per se. The, the yeah. essence of the band is still like very much an acoustic um, kind of organic sound, which is... I think part of the appeal, especially these days, it seems like. Yep. Uh, very cool. Very cool. Dave, sorry. What about on the banjos? What, what's the pickups you all are using? Uh, I think I have the Fishman Rare Art. Okay. And then I go through one of those Grace uh, Alix designs. Okay. I think. And but I actually use the same yeah, Fishman Rare to pick up and then go through a Grace Design DI. Okay. Cool. Do the job. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> just coming back into um into the album just a little bit. Uh it's called Across the Pond. Um and I'm just I'm curious on a on a few fronts here. Um I read about the title being uh really just kind of about Irish immigrants coming to the US and settling and kind of more paying homage to that, but then it kind of it, it, it is at a time in your guys' career when you've kind of done the same thing. Um, and so I'm curious, like, how does that history kind of play into your your understanding and and you know the the the, the crossover that you've you've made coming to the states? Anyone want to take that? Go ahead, yeah, Jamie. Jamie. Yeah. Jamie's got it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So obviously, there's certain songs uh, that describe the. Uh, the Irish immigrants years ago, like we did a job on the city of Chicago, uh, that describes the people coming over in 1847. But uh, I think what across the pond, really, I don't think it's time specific, because the Irish people keep on coming, 
over here to the States and they will continue to keep coming over here. So I suppose it's not it's not a historical thing. I think it's it can be both historical and very much present at the same time because I think Kevin, what's that now? Is that your waterworks? Yes. <laughs> That's it, Lewis, for you folks. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was in the factory, yeah, but it's not. Yeah. So, yeah, there's no, there's no particular timeline on it. I think it just describes Irish people coming over to the States. And I suppose not just coming over, it's what they're bringing with them. And what yeah. they bring with them, how has that affected American culture and Irish culture? So that's when you look into the history lesson of bluegrass music and how bluegrass music isn't that particularly old and when bluegrass started with bill monroe uh the influences of irish people already settled here in the states those influences with their culture and their songs and their tunes they are deeply reflected in bluegrass music and what you hear today in traditional bluegrass music and the same as american folk music or old time or whatever you want to look at that full umbrella of of genres uh, you can you can hear the Irish influence on all of them, so it's obviously still evolving, and mm -hmm. there's bands, you know, doing it t still today. Whether it's traditional bluegrass or more progressive stuff, you can still hear those Irish influences. So that's kind of what across the pond means. And I know that fifty years down the line, they're still going to be coming across the pond, and God knows what they'll bring the next time in 50 years. I don't know, but there'll be an Irish influence over here in some shape or form, you know? I completely agree. That is uh, that is definitely the truth. This is the first time you guys have actually lived here in the US, though, right? You, I mean, you've been coming across for years, but um, Dave's coming back, by the way. He just dropped out temporarily. Um, the uh, What's it like living here? Your, your residence at this point. Um, has there been anything, uh, and I can talk to this as a as an Englishman coming over to California after thirty years? Like it's it's a bit of a culture shock sometimes. Uh, have there been anything uh, that you've had to get used to that you weren't expecting? You know, difference between essentially being a, a touring band versus an actual um, part of the, part of the community. Yeah, you want to shout, boys? Um, I I would say personally that I didn't find that much of a culture shock really. Um, because I think it's the circles you hang around in as well. So if you're just immersed with fellow musicians, you kind of feel like you have a lot in common and you fit in. Obviously, there's there are slightly there's small cultural differences, but um, yeah, generally I, I didn't really feel that too much. I'm not sure how the lads feel about it, but yeah, I, uh, I'd be a little bit on the other side of things that culturally, yeah, uh, I would find it different, and but not in a bad way, yeah. do you know. But again, I would agree with Gavin. If you're hanging around with musicians and like-minded people, it definitely feels a lot more. I, I, I just think more about the Irish culture being probably more unique as, as a, a very small knit community at home, mm -hmm. things like that. That sometimes I don't think you get in a big country like this. Right. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. It's the think? expanse of the geography as well out here is just it's, oh, so, it's just massive, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. You you people uh, who don't live here or haven't spent a whole lot of time here just can't kind of wrap their heads around it at all. It's um and it's very different as you go across the country as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think as well, like we've been touring in the States since like twenty fifteen and quite a mm -hmm. lot. So at this point we we're kind of so used to being in America that that's also probably why it didn't feel like a shock to me. Yeah. But I suppose if I rewind back to when I first started. Oh, yeah, sorry, I was going from the start. Oh, yeah. Oh, at the yeah. minute? No, no, it's yeah. very useful now. But I think, at the, yeah, the first time coming here fresh off the boat, yeah, it was a big shock. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought yeah. that's what the question was. Yeah, it's also, yeah. Yeah. It's culture yeah. shock being in this basement at the minute, Kevin. Yeah, <laughs> I don't think it's going to let us leave. No, the door's already locked. Yeah. <laughs> it's cozy down here. It's pretty cozy. Yeah. I'm happy as Yeah. <laughs> So festival season's upon us. Uh, um, we're going to see you guys at Melfest. Any particular festivals you're looking forward to uh, playing this year? Uh, Merlefest, yeah. Delfest is another one. Oh, good. Uh, Excellent. We're playing... Uh, what's the one Vancouver in... Vancouver Island. Vancouver Island. Island Music Fest. Mendocino F Music Festival, potentially. Yeah. It's in Mendocino, California. Yeah. yeah. Oh, cool. Air Creek in 
northern Alberta, Canada. Mm -hmm. And we're at a few of the Irish folk fests as well around the Midwest that would always be a regular staple in our summer tours. So, yeah, got a, a couple of guys in the, in the chat who remember you um, from when you did the Huddersfield show at Eagle Music uh, oh, a few yeah. years back. Uh, it's been a long time since I saw them in Huddersfield at the Eagle Deering Banjo Day, and we had a great workshop on tenor banjo from Gavin. Are they likely to tour the UK anytime soon? I think we've had a couple of other people asking similar uh, questions. So spill the beans. Are you going to be around the UK, Ireland area, Europe? Um, we'll certainly be playing in Ireland uh, as much as we possibly can. But I suppose with fellas over here in the States, it's not as, as easy to line up uh, UK tours or European stuff. But that's not saying we won't in the future. Uh, I wouldn't say it'll be in this calendar year, but potentially 2025, you know, we have our UK agent who's always uh, contacting us about different things and potential opportunities. So, yeah, we, uh, we won't rule it out. We just don't have anything set in stone at the moment. It's all good. I'm sure you'll be the first to announce it as it comes around. So, Absolutely. Uh, Dave, you're back. Yeah, we have a couple other questions in here. For, uh, we have, uh, let's see, Elizabeth Wash is saying, what's the set list for next week? Uh, who are they looking forward to this time? I think she's referring to the Opry show, I think. Yeah, I think the Opry show. Oh, yeah. Uh, we haven't decided on that just yet. We have three songs, but uh, we're open to suggestions. If the, the Jig Jam fans want to send us their oh, yeah. thoughts, we'd love to hear them. Drop them in the comments. What songs yeah. do you want to hear? Nice. We've got another question from Victor C. He's wondering about how how was your St. Paddy's Day celebration? It's great. Yeah, it was uh, it's definitely a little bit different than uh, other years. We did a, a matinee show in Northampton, Massachusetts. Um, which was a nice cool little venue called Bombix. And then we finished off in a place in Cape Cod that night. So we did a little double gig that day. We kept ourselves busy. It's the one day a year we can get away with doing two gigs. <laughs> I don't think anyone else would have us for two gigs any other time of year. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I think so. Uh, Michael is asking, when will Ryan O'Reilly officially join the band? <laughs> yeah, we sure. him up, so, He's in yeah. The works. yeah, we'll see him next week in Nashville. So I'm not sure if you, Ryan O'Reilly's a, a hockey player that was the captain of the St. Louis team here. And we got friendly with him over the years, and he's currently playing with the Nashville Predators. So we'll see him at uh, the Opry next week. So maybe he'll jump up for a, a belt of a song. Who knows? Nice. With the Preds, huh? The Preds, cool. yeah. 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 Excellent, excellent. Uh, and Kelly is suggesting uh, chicken talk at the Opry. Please, that's the question. <laughs> <laughs> back in the band. <laughs> All right, gentlemen. Uh, any final thoughts, words of wisdom? And then I've got a request uh, that you might want to play out with. Um, yeah. yeah, we're playing Friday in Off Broadway here in St. Louis. That's a plug for that. It's nearly sold out. Yes. Uh, Looking forward where to can that. people find you? Let's talk about that. We're in Kevin's basement. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Come on down. Come on down. Yeah. Send the search party. Uh, We're making pizza tonight. So. Yeah. Uh, Jigjam.ie <laughs> is the website. And then our social media handle is Jigjam Live. Uh, Man. Covers it all. Looks like I had that queued up. <laughs> Perfect. Go check them out. And the new album is on all the normal platforms, Spotify, Apple, Apple um, Music, and all that kind of good stuff. I yeah. think said iTunes there. Uh, that's showing my age just a little bit. Yeah, it's I have, you, I have you on my iPod Nano. And, uh, uh, you know. yeah. <laughs> One thing I did just before we wrap up, you, you had um, Becky Bueller on the album as well, didn't you? Yeah, she did. She sang on the city of Chicago. Which is she's a great song in and of itself, but uh, yeah. how how was that, and how did that come about? Because she's she's cool. She's good friends of ours. Yeah, she's a friend of ours that we met at a few festivals over the years, and um, yeah, 
I suppose we we wanted to we were open to collaborating with again we didn't have any plan and then we waited until we recorded stuff and they were like well what does it does any particular track need anything and we hadn't put harmony on the city of Chicago and Kevin's voice just wasn't cutting it for the same you know <laughs> no. so we needed a bluegrass female in there yeah I know we just thought it'd be nice to have a female vocal uh, mixed in I think it's nice in general no matter what the song is but that particular song we thought it might be a nice uh, avenue to go down and we thought about who we could ask and Becky was top of the list because awesome. we had just seen her a few weeks before that so we sent her a text and she was all up for it so yeah it was great to have her on were you able to do that in person or was that kind of a send the track and have her do it wherever she was at it was send the track she recorded with uh Stephen Mugan who's okay. Sam Bush's guitar player he is mm -hmm. a studio and uh it was done yet yeah, remotely down there but the next time we share the bill on a festival lineup with becky i'd imagine we'll uh team up and sing it live as well so oh, that'll cool. be a treat that'd be really cool yep and she's normally at ibma and i think you guys yep. quite often come down to ibma in uh, september yep. as well so yep. um so yeah we'll be at millfest in the um the vendor tent right towards the back stage area uh, of the main stage. So, uh, do you make a promise right here, right now, to drop by and say hi? Promise. Yes. Promise. There you go. You heard it there, Dave. Yeah, promise. I heard it. Right. <laughs> Excellent stuff. Well, we've got one request. Um, Kelly is asking, any chance we can get the lads to play June Apple? Ah, there we go. Well, we weren't going to play we this one, play but uh, we we're supposed to play it. Yeah, this there was the plan. That was the plan all along. Uh, okay. Yeah. Guys, <laughs> thank you so, so much for your time today. That was awesome. Really, really fun as always. Um, wishing you the very, very best with the album, with everything you're doing uh, this year, this summer. Um, and thank you everyone for tuning in, whether it's live now or later on the replay. Enjoy Jig Jam on the way out. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much. Thanks, man. Thanks. Just do, do the same as we've been doing. The same tune as we've been doing recently. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's oh, yeah. Same tune we've been doing recently. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think Kevin heard the other plan. Okay. Yeah. So same, same as we did. Yeah. Same okay. tune as we've done Rehearsal. recently. Rehearsal. Don't overthink it, Kevin. I, I, Whatever comes I out of your fingers. Guarantee it won't. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, one, two, three. Well, I wish I were a June apple hanging on a tree. Every time I chew the fast, think about me. Think about me. Think about me. Every time I chew the fast, think about me. Well, I wish I were a June apple 